Welcome to this presentation on tissue healing and recovery. This follows on from the level three tissue healing knowledge that you've gained and we're going to go deeper into the anatomy, we're going to discuss collagen in a little bit more detail, chronic and systemic inflammation and also how inflammation relates to pain. So we're going that bit deeper in your knowledge to be able to help and support your clients further. What we will cover in this online learning. We're going to discuss the different stages of healing that occurs after an injury and what happens at each individual stage. We're going to discuss what collagen is and its relation into tissue healing, the difference between local and systemic inflammation, and how inflammation relates to pain. As mentioned previously, this is a follow on from your level three learning, where we're going to go a little bit deeper with the knowledge and information to be able to support your clients within your sports massage clinics. Phases of tissue healing. Tissue healing is all about regeneration and repair. And during this process, there are four main phases or stages that your patients will need to go through to heal after an injury. Now, the time frame for these aren't textbook, and it will vary depending on many factors such as how well their tissues heal and the severity of the injury. But it gives you an idea of where your client or patient may be along this spectrum. This slide is just about an overview of the four stages or phases, and we'll break each one down individually. But let's have a quick look at the time frames. So the first one is the bleeding phase, so the very initial stage after injury, and that lasts for four to eight hours, depending on the client and the injury. The next phase we have is the inflammation phase, which happens around the first two to three days and can continue up to several weeks after injury. Next is the proliferation stage, which will begin around 24 to 48 hours, right up to two to three weeks after the injury. And the final stage is a remodeling stage. And this happens around one to two weeks post injury and can continue up to 18 months after the initial injury. The bleeding phase. So within this phase, there are two main stages that the healing process has to go through. So the first one is to stop the bleeding completely. And the second one is to create clotting to keep the injury into that local area. So the first process, which is stopping the bleeding is hemostasis. And what happens there is that bleeding stops, histamine is released, which creates that swelling, which then allows the platelets to be activated. And then a whole load of enzymes are released to the area to then move into the clotting phase of healing. The platelets are exposed to the collagen within the area and they create that platelet plug, so the clotting around that area. And what that clotting does, it restricts and obstructs the lymphatic fluid drainage, which then helps the localised injury within that area. And those enzymes work together to really coagulate, to really localise the injury and create that clotting process. The next phase is the inflammation phase. Now, just a note that inflammation is completely normal and it's a necessary process to help with tissue healing. So it's important that we have that within our healing processes. So inflammation is not bad. And what that inflammation does is it initiates that healing process. It keeps that injury localised and contained and it will gradually resolve itself within two to three weeks. But it is a normal process that has to happen. And just to recap on those five cardinal signs of inflammation, rubor, which is redness, calor, increased heat around the area, tumor, swelling, and then functional laser, which is loss of function. So when you're working with your clients and you're trying to find out which phase of tissue healing they may be in, then look for these signs to determine whether your client may be in the inflammation phase. So within the inflammation phase, we have macrophages, which are white blood cells, and they arrive in the area and they mop up and remove any debris and bacteria from the injury site. Think of them like Pac-Man, picking up all the bits along the way. So they're removing any extra debris and bacteria from that injury. And what they also do is they release growth factors and cytokines, which are then involved in the proliferation phase. And what happens is when there's less uh, oxygen to the area, macrophages are stimulated to create uh, a process to help increase local blood flow and circulation to the area.
It's important to note that in the inflammation phase and also in the bleeding phase, that there are pro-inflammatory molecules that are released, which creates inflammation. And they can be released in the first hour of any significant tissue trauma. But alongside that, there are also anti-inflammatory molecules to control the inflammatory response, which is uh, released within a couple of hours of significant tissue trauma. So the body has a really good way of balancing out and ensuring that the right amount of inflammation occurs in a local injury. The proliferation phase. So this process is all about restoring tissue with laying down of brand new tissue. And it goes through two stages during this process. The first one is fibroplasia or fibroplasia. And this is where the fibroblasts lay down new type 3 collagen. So fibroblasts are connected tissue cells and create new collagen. So they create type 3 after an injury. And we'll talk about collagen in a few slides time. But just to mention that type 3 collagen is a lot weaker and less flexible than the original tissue. But it's the first process to restoring that tissue. The second stage in the proliferation phase is angiogenesis, and that is about creating new blood cells and new blood vessels. So in this area, the capillaries around the injured site start to bud and they grow towards the actual injury itself. And then this then re-establishes blood flow to the area, bringing important nutrients to that injury site. And one of those important nutrients to consider is oxygen. So we need oxygen to help with the healing process. So someone is a poor wound healer, if they have a poor diet or, as an example, they're a smoker, then this process will be restricted. And the next phase is the remodeling phase. And this phase is all about remodeling the newly laid down connective tissue into mature scar tissue. So the type 3 collagen, so the weaker collagen that's initially laid down, is reabsorbed by the enzyme collagenase which then turns into type 1 collagen, which has a lot more tensile strength. Type 3 collagen is also really disorganised, so this process helps reorganise the type 3 collagen into type 1, and then that type 1 collagen is orientated to the lines of local stresses or mechanical stresses, depending on how that person moves or doesn't move. We're going to talk about the local lines of stresses alongside collagen. So the next slide we're going to come into is all about what collagen is and why we need it in our tissues. Collagen. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the body and there are at least 15 different types of collagen that have been recorded. However, the Kumkar and Bona study suggests there are at least 25 different types of collagen. So the research is still inconclusive. Type 1 collagen is the most abundant in the body, around 90%, and it's found within the skin, the bone, tendons, uh, ligaments, and within the fascia. But fascia itself can contain an array of different collagen types, according to the Kumkar Bona study, suggesting that it's not limited to types between 1 and 24. The shape of collagen is a triple helix shape, which gives it its tensile strength. And gram for gram, it's been suggested that uh, collagen is stronger than steel. So it's a really strong fibre within the body. And it's also an example of Wolf's Law is a study by Taylor that found there was an increased amount of osteoblast production in a tennis player's racket arm as opposed to their non-racket arm. So the more that they were creating mechanical stress on that arm increased that cellular production, creating stronger bones. So therefore, it's really important that we create enough mechanical stress to help improve the quality of the repaired tissue if we're thinking about how Wolf's Law relates to collagen. So the next slide, we're going to look at unused tissue or unused collagen and or immobilized collagen and collagen of tissues that is mobilized and used well. And as you can see here, um, there are three different images. Next, we're going to discuss the tissue healing stages for bone injuries. Now, this is new for the level four sports massage, and it's a good idea for you to be aware of how bones heal if you're working with clients post fractures or any other uh, bone injuries. There are four main stages of healing after a fracture or a bone injury. The first one is where the hematoma forms. Then the fibrocartilaginous um, tissue forms then the bone becomes slightly more hard, so more callous, and then the bone remodels completely. So let's look at each of those areas individually in relation to the general stages of tissue healing.
During the inflammation phase of a fracture, similarly to regular tissue healing, macrophages, neutrophils, platelets release those several cytokines to help create the infl inflammatory response and that hematoma forms around that bony area. Next is the proliferation phase, which is where the fibroplasts and the mesenchymal cells, they migrate to the fracture site and then forms granulated tissue around the fracture, the fracture ends. And this is where the proliferation of the osteoblasts and fibroblasts begin to start to repair the tissue. The next thing to occur in the proliferation phase is the callus formation, which happens around the two week mark. If the bones aren't touching, then a soft callus will form instead. And a callus is a cartilaginous tissue which um, forms around the end of the fracture site uh, to help that healing. It remains quite weak and it's very different to regular bone, but it's part of that healing process. From then, more of the cartilaginous tissue will start to be produced around that site, so type 2 and then also type 1. And what's important to note is the amount of callus um, that's formed is inversely proportional to the extent of immobilization that's keeping that fracture site still and immobilized. Next thing to happen is the remodeling phase. And this is where cartilaginous calcification starts to take place at that junction between the maturing maturing chondrocytes and the newly formed bones, the two ends of the initial fractures. The newly formed bone, its woven bone, is remodelled and organised via the relationship and activity between osteoblasts and osteoclasts. And it's shaped through Wolf's Law, and this is where movement uh, will start to support the remodelling of fracture sites. And just a note here that movement is completely essential after an injury for remodeling tissue and building strength. And that is both in soft tissue injuries and bone or fracture injuries. The next section of this presentation is to look at the relationship between local and systemic inflammation and pain. So let's discuss local inflammation and pain. And if you haven't watched it recently, it's best to recap the Why We Feel Pain module, as that gives you a little bit of an idea of the reasons why we might feel pain if you haven't read through it or listened to it since you finished your level three course. Inflammation and injury are potential contributors to a pain state, so they may contribute to how your client feels pain, but also may not. What we do know is the range of sensory nerves that are nociceptive or have a nociceptive component, which are the danger detectors, they increase in the presence of inflammation. So there's more danger detectors when inflammation is present, which is really interesting. And we also know that pain is multifactorial and signs of inflammation aren't the only factors that contribute to why we feel pain. But it's important to rule any local inflammation out if your client is experiencing pain by looking at those inflammation markers and the cardinal signs of inflammation. But it's really important to note that if there is inflammation in that local area, then there are more sensory nerves that are danger detectors that can detect uh, danger, which then may create a pain response. So let's talk about systemic inflammation, as we've been spending a lot of time talking about local inflammation as part of most of this presentation. Systemic inflammation is where the body is under a constant state of inflammation and the balance between the pro-inflammatory molecules and the anti-inflammatory molecules has been shifted. And there are more pro-inflammatory molecules being released as opposed to the anti-inflammatory molecules. The relationship between local inflammation and systemic inflammation begins to overlap and so they interact with each other. But it's important that the set point between the balance of pro and anti-inflammatory molecules um, is neutral. And that's that's really important for, for us as, as humans. And the shift that can happen for many reasons, and it's not just related to injury, but we want to make sure we try and create that balance as much as possible. And that shift can happen for things that aren't related to injury, such as taking medications, such as opioids, a poor nutrition, chronic stress, viruses, and many other things that may create more chronic inflammation within the body. And that's why it's really important that we start to discuss lifestyle with their clients rather than just the presenting condition or complaint. Following on from that, 
the nociceptor, so the danger detectors, are highly influenced by the body's inflammatory set point. So if the set point has been increased, so there are more pro-inflammatory molecules being released, and the body's protective mechanism has increased, then the amount of nociceptors is also increased, which may potentially lead to somebody experiencing more pain if they if their system is inflamed, if they are experiencing systemic inflammation. So things like nutrition, stress, smoking, uh, taking lots of medication can all impact how someone perceives pain, regardless of whether they've experienced an injury or not. And that's a really big takeaway, as we really want to focus on your client's whole well-being and not just a particular injury. So just in summary of the whole of this presentation, so there are four main stages of healing after an acute injury. Inflammation is a really important part of tissue healing and we need inflammation to help that healing process. We want to ensure that our clients are moving in the remodeling phase as that is key to help with the laying down of new collagen um, and also in creating new bone after a fracture injury. Local inflammation can contribute to pain. But what's really interesting is that systemic inflammation increases the body's protective mechanism, which can potentially increase how a person also feels pain. And here are some references um, for you to do some further reading in this area if you find this really interesting.